Advanced City Office of Community Engagement. First of all, I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil This year is the third year that we have the pleasure to host the award-winning series Shaping Vancouver. This, year, this year's series will focus on reshaping the conversation by looking at how we can expand the definition of heritage to make it more inclusive and representative. Tonight's conversation is titled, The Future of Heritage in Vancouver. I would like now to introduce Javier Campos. Javier is the principal of Campos Studio. Prior to that, Javier was, founded, was a founding partner of Campos Lecky Studio whose modernist work has been published nationally and internationally. He participated as a thesis advisor and guest critic at, the, at UBC and at F, UFT. He's the president of Heritage Vancouver Society and a board member of the Contemporary Art Gallery. Welcome, Javier. Thank you everyone for coming. I guess these uh, are getting a little fancier. I didn't know I was going to have be introduced, so I have to skip through a couple of my notes here. Uh, as a, this is our third year here, and it is our uh, conversations on heritage. It's a way that we want to stay relevant, and um, we um, we do focus still on com on conservation. We've been involved in the character home review and the Ferrar uh, fridge. But this place here is really special because this is where we get to discuss things around heritage, about what it means. And um, it's how Shape in Vancouver is a series that we have, as I said, to stay relevant. Um, we're extremely honored. We were uh, Heritage BC gave us the outstanding, outstanding achievement award for education and awareness uh, this year. We got an award from the last year, so that makes us feel very good that we're uh, doing something relevant. Um, I think today's topic is uh, very important as we move forward. Uh, I think we've been defining heritage in the last 30 years or so. Uh, in different ways, but this uh, finally came to Vancouver and other places, and uh, hopefully this we can discuss uh, this uh, thematic framework as a criteria for evaluation and uh, as we move forward, and we add it uh, to our existing tools for assessment. Um, I think it'll be interesting to discuss how this actually might work in terms of being part of policy and how it might affect advisory groups as it is a, a general set of ideas and how that might help us. Um, I think it signals Vancouver's uh, move towards a uh, more value-based approach. And um, I think it, what's really important, it'll help us look at uh, what we have uh, valued over the past and perhaps uh, what has been missed in that same period of time and how we can make uh, reparations towards that. Um, hopefully it'll be a wider application and um, give us a guide to the future development of the city and city building here and maybe we can see how it might be incorporated into city plans and neighborhood plans and shaping that. Um, certainly we're very excited because uh, this fits into the goals for the Heritage Vancouver Society of um, including heritage as an essential component in the discussions of uh, city building and um, to make sure that uh, we have a framework for heritage that's both inclusive and diverse in our city. Um, certainly we'll see hopefully the, how maybe uh, these thematic frameworks can be aspirational and can help us. Uh, we can also help discuss how we engage the public and how the public can engage with this. And um, now I'd like to uh, start to tackle the discussion. I'd like to thank all the panelists that are here, especially the City of Vancouver for participating for the first time, which we're very excited about. So uh, with that, I'll introduce Donald Luxton, who is going to give us a presentation on the uh, Heritage Action Plan thematic framework. And then we have our other panelists that are here. It's uh, Helen Kane as a city planner, Candice Knowles Arnold from the City of Vancouver, Joanne Prof from UBC, and Brittany Quayle from uh, New Westminster. So Don, if you'd like to come up and start that. Thank you everyone for coming. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, hope we have a lively discussion on the topic. 
Uh, I'm going to race through, uh, they haven't given me a lot of time here to talk about the uh, thematic framework that we're doing as part of the Heritage Action Plan, a project that started in 2014 uh, and is just wrapping up now. We're um, uh, just getting to the end of the uh, Heritage Action Plan uh, submissions and documentation. Uh, but part of the action plan uh, involved, the, it, as an overall update of the Heritage Conservation Program for the city, involved an update of the Heritage Register, which sounds really easy if you say it really quickly. Um, but uh, it's a little more challenging than that. It, 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 it's part of, it's the information base within the Heritage Conservation Program, as you can see in the little green box on the left. Um, it ties to everything else, and we always, within our work on the Heritage Action Plan, saw all of these elements as integrated. And so, what we were trying to do in our work was really find a way to provide a foundational base for this upgrade. To do that, we have had really been looking for how to take the various individual components of the city's heritage program and fit them into a system that made sense and to anchor it in values-based assessment. Uh, and to that end, we're aligning to international protocols like the Burra Charter, but also standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada, which has a, a conservation decision-making um, process, three-part, sequential, just like Burra Charter, understanding your historic resource, planning for, for uh, conservation, and actually undertaking the intervention. So we took this as kind of the basis for our recommendations, and you can see where the historic context statement and thematic framework fit at the beginning as tools to help understand in evaluation and analysis. Uh, so this was what uh, the upgrade process included, and as you can see, the first point is to find a values-based approach to the Heritage Conservation Program. We did that through this documentation uh, that then leads to a revised evaluation framework. The register, as you will all know, is the list of official sites considered to have um, heritage value in the city of Vancouver. It's, um, it was a list first put together in 1986, rolled over into the heritage register in 1994, and it's approximately 2,200 building structures, streetscapes, landscapes, uh, and trees and monuments and public works like the Burrard Bridge. Um, and there's a number of guidelines that uh, follow that have been adopted for heritage register resources, including things like building code equivalencies, etc. So we took this list, this idea of this listing of significance, and began to look around the world for our best practice models. And Immediately, you run up against what everybody else is doing, which really falls within a series of protocols defined by UNESCO, to which Canada is a signatory party. One of the key ones that we looked at was the Historic Urban Landscape Protocol, which we used as kind of the basis for our recommendations for management. And it's a, I won't go into a lot of detail, it's possible in the time I have, but uh, we use that as kind of an understanding that Vancouver is a historic city and it is built out and we are curating it and we need to think about everything from sustainability to heritage conservation within this integrated framework and it's a, a very good model and internationally uh, adhered to. Our best, we looked around the world at for different models for thematic frameworks and heritage registers and the very, very best model we found that was current is going on in Los Angeles right now. I won't go into a lot of detail, but if you look up uh, Historic Places LA and LA Survey, you get a sense of the scale and breadth and scope of what they're doing down there. It's absolutely astonishing. It's been a 10-year program. Uh, Los Angeles, of course, is 10 times the size of Vancouver in land mass and number of buildings, and they're, they're surveying 29,000 buildings. It's about the same kind of scale as our register. Uh, but they have the resources of the Getty Institute that's working with them to really set up not only the, um, uh, the software and database management program, which is open source and anybody can use it, uh, but also to set up a series of contexts similar to, very similar, same methodology as we are doing in Vancouver. Their contexts, because they have so much more in terms of resources, are far more detailed, but they have 
as you can see here, here's just a couple of examples like the Jewish history context. They take each theme and just wring it out and really um, uh, throw a lot of resources at it, which of course we didn't, we didn't have the opportunity, but we have set up this kind of thematic framework and we know it to be very good, solid methodology. Uh, the historic context and thematic framework, what are they? Uh, the historic con context is a narrative history of the city broken down, uh, first of all, chronologically and then into themes. The thematic framework is uh, based on uh, the thematic development that flows from that, and together they form the foundational basis for moving forward to identify um, the sites that would be considered to be missing or gaps on the existing heritage register. And as you can see here, they just, again, there's a system where they flow right one into the other, and also the evaluation framework that we're suggesting falls out of this process as well. Goals and objectives provide a values-based approach to the Heritage Conservation Program, analysis of potential gaps, uh, the, the thematic framework is really also meant to help with the de development of statements of significance by defining themes that would become the values that would be in the statements of significance. But we also find there's many other uses for these documents. Uh, we've produced many of them over the years, and uh, what we find is that they are also valuable planning tools. They're tools that communities can uh, find inspirational for uh, everything from kind of interpretation programs to commemoration. Uh, and can help in development of policy. Um, our historic context statement is divided into eight chapters. Uh, of course, every municipality is unique, and Vancouver has a unique geography, which we call where the river and the mountains meet the ocean. We include and include throughout the, um, uh, throughout the documents uh, First Nations as an integral part of the history of the city and also other cultural uh, uh, groups that settled the city, uh, contact, early Burrard Inlet settlements, terminal city, Edwardian era boom, conflict and turmoil, which is First and Second World War and Depression, and post-war Vancouver. Those are the kind of broad categories that we put the historic events within. Uh, the thematic framework derives from the work done by Parks Canada in the national thematic framework which has been in place since 2000, when it was last updated, uh, which is the, the framework used to choose and assess, evaluate national historic sites. So this is putting the lens on at a national level. It's a five-theme, 24-sub-theme uh, process. Um, and in discussions with Parks Canada, they recognize the limitations of something that was done 17 years ago when so much work has been done globally on things like intangible cultural heritage, on um, many other aspects of conservation and moving towards values-based assessment. So there's some ways in which this could be improved. We worked with the system and have worked with it many times. And we struggled with it, and we ended up accepting the five main themes, but tweaking them uh, to make them make more sense for what uh, we were trying to do. First of all, our thematic framework comes right up to the present, so we don't want to indicate that we aren't being current. So um, the other theme that we felt we couldn't call people in the land, as the feds do, we called habitation, which is much more respectful of First Nations uh, uh, claims and uh, uh, reality. Uh, developing economies, we named economies. Governing Canada, we named governance. Uh, express, expressing um, uh, community life, we just called society, people living together and finding ways to accommodate. Uh, and expressing intellectual and culture, cultural life became arts. Pretty straightforward as a five-themed system. But within those five themes, there are 32 sub-themes that we broke down, and we found that those sub-themes really weren't fine-grained enough either, and we had to find another breakdown, which we call components, of which there are 103. Uh, it's a massive piece of work if you ever need a doorstop. Uh, we are going to have it out soon. It's, it's not publicly available yet because it's being reviewed right now by a peer review committee, uh, technical committee. Um, but it's, uh, I'll give you a 
sense of the scope of this document. Under habitation, you can see we covered First Nations presence, cultural communities, urban planning, neighborhood development, and cultural landscapes. So really, habitation of the land. Planning, for example, you'll see, and this is where the, it overlaps with the historic context statement. You'll see that when we talk about, for example, planning, transforming the environment, like filling in False Creek, mapping and surveying, street layout, surveying, uh, early civic planning, the Bartholomew plan, and post-war urban planning. So we can cover within those components a very broad range of topics, which are illustrated by many sites within the city. Uh, culture, I should mention cultural landscapes um, uh, brings into play our understanding of, of human modified landscapes and how important that is within the development of the city. Um, economies, the obvious ones, port city, transportation and infrastructure broken down, communication, um, extraction, production and distribution, again starting with First Nations and there were many ways in which we did start with First Nations throughout and we think that's appropriate and respectful. Uh, trade, commerce and service industries, right down to personal care, hotels and tourism, and of course labor and the history of labor, seasonal labor, labor unrest and organization. Theme three, governance. Um, Coast Salish governance, starting with civic administration politics, and uh, something that came up in the discussions that just went, aha, foreign consuls, something never covered before in our thinking of the city. Um, law, order, and security, police, fire, etc., uh, fire department, and defending Vancouver, uh, Vancouver at war, and cenotaphs and war memorials, and how those all uh, work within that structure. Society, how people uh, live together and care for each other, and uh, communicated and, and it's a fascinating breakdown, spiritual life, which includes religion, education at all levels, healthcare, social services, and public housing. Come back to that one in a minute. One of those fascinating ones for me, who is not a sports guy, uh, was this incredible history and it just amazing and I, I hadn't really understood the breadth of it, so the research to me was just fascinating. Sports and recreation became one of the key things in society of how people related, especially multiculturally. If you think of the Asahi uh, baseball team, and there were Chinese hockey leagues, and there, it was just these, this real communal kind of and competitive kind of activity that really helped define the community. Uh, community associations, uh, secret and benevolent societies, etc. And one of the more fascinating things that I felt actually really got closest to defining Vancouver as a unique place was the social and reform movements. Uh, temperance and prohibition, equal rights, suffrage and women's rights, real history there, gay liberation and LGBT community, the counterculture, yes, the counterculture in Vancouver, uh, inseparable, and the environmental movement, of course. And finally, the arts breaks down into Coast Salish artistic expression, architecture and design, where we covered the history of architecture in the city, and visual arts, theater, music, dance, literature, cinema, community collections, which we pulled in for the first time, popular entertainment, exhibition fairs, cultural events, and media, which brings us right up to digital media. So again, current. Uh, this allowed us, as we developed this framework, to do a gap analysis of what was on the register and what was not on the register. And having worked on the register back in 1986, I can tell you that I was well aware of its flaws and faults and challenges and what was picked up and what wasn't. So not surprisingly, Vancouver's register has exactly the same major gaps that um, Canada's National Historic Sites have demonstrated. Uh, commemoration of Indigenous history, we just don't have that many sites that relate to First Nations. Commemoration of ethno-cultural communities and commemoration of women's history. So we kept those firmly in mind as we moved forward, but there were many other gaps as we looked at this kind of broader understanding. And we realized what we were getting into. It was the tip of the iceberg, all right, and there was lots underwater on this one. So we tried, we tried tackling it through this gap analysis and trying to figure out what was and wasn't on the register. That was kind of the starting point. It's just looking at the various themes and sub-themes and components and saying, what illustrates that? And what is on the register and what isn't? And it became a very fascinating exercise of why one thing was on and one thing wasn't. So, 
industrial, for example, um, industrial theme. Uh, on the register, Roger Sugar, no surprise. Not on the register, Celtic Shipyards, the last shipyard left to ship repair facility uh, historically in the city. Uh, outdoor music performance venues, we have kind of two left. One is the Alexandra Park Bandstand, which is on the register, and Malkin Bowl, which is not. So we begin to see how we can use this to kind of quantify and then think about what might illustrate something that isn't illustrated. One's a bandstand, one's a band shell. Different structures, so quite interesting. Uh, we became aware, and there's lots of research on it, we dove a little deeper though into Vancouver's original red light district. Uh, in 1911, the, the prostitutes were very firmly told to move into an area near the waterfront in the 500 and 600 block of Jackson, um, uh, which is now Alexander Street. Uh, for several years, every building on the, those two blocks uh, was either built by, owned by, or occupied women. Uh, one building is on, one of the brothels is on the Heritage Register, five are not. Uh, one of the things, the happy coincidences was that as we were identifying um, corner stores and early commercial stores, uh, which are so important to the history of the neighborhood development, that the city, through some things that happened with the Marché Saint-Georges um, ch um, changed bylaw to allow corner stores to kind of loosen up and allow them to be more non-conforming, which was a very happy accident because we were identifying a whole bunch of them at the time uh, this was occurring. Uh, one of the more uh, interesting um, finds was that um, when we looked at uh, public housing programs, the very first public housing programs were the soldier settlement schemes uh, after the First World War. Uh, there were examples on the register from, of course, there were three separate municipalities, Vancouver, Point Grey, and South Van. Before 1929, there were examples of uh, uh, soldier settlement houses from Vancouver and from Point Grey on the register, but nothing from South Van. And so, again, an exploration of the history of it turned up a uh, fascinating um, uh, set of buildings, three buildings that are still intact, designed by the province's chief architect at the time, South Van, asked for help with this, so the province sent over plans. They're charming little houses, very unique, and uh, sprinkled in South Vancouver. And lastly, just to kind of illustrate um, the uh, what we were trying to do was not just identify buildings, and again, this is a broader thinking uh, similar to the way that the uh, Parks Canada has National Historic Sites, but which are buildings and cultural landscapes. But they also have the National Historic Events, National Historic People, National Historic Railway Stations, National Historic Lighthouses, uh, and National Historic Prime Minister's Grave Sites. Um, so they begin to think about a much broader way to commemorate history than just looking at buildings. And so, uh, we know that there's within, wrapped within the thematic framework, there's a lot of potential commemoration activity and, and intangible cultural heritage. It does help identify the register sites, but it talks about it more broadly. And one site that I'll just leave you with as an illustration of why this process was so broad-based and why we um, found it so helpful, um, we know that, for example, Nellie Yip Kwong is a National Historic Person. Uh, she's recognized and she's signif sig considered significant and her house has been recognized by the Vancouver Heritage Foundation's Places That Matter program, but her house was not on the register. So this is the type of congruence that we're trying to get to, uh, to identify sites that have those layers of value, multivalent values, uh, importance to Vancouver's history, but also to take it beyond the idea of just the bricks and mortar being important and defining values. So that's the uh, very quick overview of the thematic framework we've been working on. Uh, thanks very much.